So it feels like almost 75% of this chapter is about not actually transcription, but about the before transcription and the pre before and the start and the pre start before start of transcription. So how about what actually happens during transcription? Actual transcription itself is a lot simpler than the pre initiation, pre pre initiation, the before pre start initiation of transcription. So RNA polymerase does not need a primer to initiate. Okay, unlike DNA polymerase, it just starts, it takes off. So here's our, again, our, could we make these bigger here? So we're starting at the five prime and heading towards the three prime direction. I just put that under my video, that doesn't really help. Okay, one strand is used as the template. Okay, the other strand, the coding strand, actually matches the transcript that's being produced. The template strand is complementary to the transcript. There, so the RNA can, polymerase can put down the complementary base pair and form the strand of mRNA. Okay. The next base is always added to the three prime end, so elongation is five prime to three prime. Why do these mushrooms kill you? They stop this process from working. Uh, the um, key protein here in um, the amanita mushrooms called alpha amanitin uh, stops this process. It blocks RNA polymerase from, from adding um, uh, base pairs to mRNA transcripts. And so that kills you very quickly. Okay. So here's transcription in bacteria. So again, bacteria do not have nuclei, therefore transcription and translation take place at the same time. And we can literally see that. We are seeing in these pictures multiple transcripts being made from a gene simultaneously. So starting down here, so we've got, here's the little DNA strand right here. And then we have the promoter region where the, the RNA um, polymerases are just starting to get on. And then we see them, these, um, these little chains here are the actual mRNAs coming off of that of that DNA. Okay, and so we see the RNA polymerases going along and the RNA transcripts growing. And so we know that this, this is the start up here. And then as transcriptions, the, the, the length of the transcripts is growing as the RNA polymerases keep going. And this is cool where in a bacterial cell, you would also be a giant mess because as these RNA transcripts are growing, they're also, the ribosomes are grabbing on and starting translation immediately. Bacteria is so cool. The other cool thing that bacteria do is genes with related functions are often located together and transcribed together. You guys have heard of the lac operon. I hope you did the lac operon in GenBio because man, are we jumping right into operons, okay? So you have, in this case, you have one promoter upstream of all the genes in the operon, and then you just get this like big, and you got like five, here or five um, genes for tryptophan biosynthesis. They all just happen to be in one long pathway, probably pretty evolutionary advantageous. Okay. So that, that helps. And so you get this one long transcript and they have each coding regions on it. So there's multiple stop codons there. So you'll make these different subunits of related proteins all in one go, and you'll make them in exactly the proportion you need in order to make tryptophan. Okay. And so it's kind of a handy dandy little uh, structure there, which we'll talk about more in when we get to chapter 14 in regulation. Okay. How do bacteria stop transcription? Okay, they, uh, two ways, either there's this row dependent termination where there's literally a protein that removes the transcript from the template, uh, kind of pulls, pulls the transcript right off and stops RNA polymerase uh, ability to keep going. Or we have this row independent termination where we form a RNA hairpin because we have these complementary bonds between the um, mRNA and then that gets um, stopped and the RNA polymerase can't progress and stuff. So there's, there's just two different ways that bacteria terminate transcription. That's basically what I want you to take from that. Okay. Meanwhile, in eukaryotes, great. We have transcribed our gene, huzzah, it is it is there. The problem is it's not ready yet because we still have all these pesky introns that need to be removed. Okay, because we just want the exons there. So first, we what we need is we need a cap. This um, uh, on the five prime end, we want this methylated cap, which is literally needed for export outside the nucleus. The nuclear pores prevent mRNA that does not have this cap from leaving. 
And then we have this poly A tail, which helps because we always, we always have these little exonucleases that are going to try and chop, chop, chop at the end of unprotected uh, nucleic acid floating around the cell because that's what viral DNA is, is nucleic acid floating around the cell. So we have this little protective tail here to um, uh, give the exonucleases something to nibble on while we get the rest of the gene translated uh, outside of the, um, the nucleus. And then next, the other thing we need to do is splice out the introns, splice together the exons. And so these guys, um, the intervening sequence, so intervening intron expressed exon. And then uh, those little pieces will get degraded uh, again by our handy little um, nucleases that are searching for foreign DNA and such and RNA. And then those exons are connected together. And now we have our, what we call a mature I can totally write with a pencil mature mRNA is ready to go out into the world and be translated. Now splicing, uh, this is the cool thing about eukaryotes is that we can um, from one particular gene sequence make a bunch of different related proteins which are called isoforms. Okay? So you can have these different splicing patterns and for one particular gene. So the first one's called exon skipping. You could just leave out exon two. You know, some of this, it's included in some, but not all copies of the gene. You can have an alternative five prime site where um, occasionally the first exon is cut at a different location. So you get two different start sites. Uh, and the corollary to that is the alternative three prime site where you could have one ending spot and a different ending spot. Um, so either the half of the exon or, or full, leaving the full piece. And then what's interesting, mutually exclusive exons where you only ever have one of the two. You never have, say, exon one, two, three, and four together. It's either exon one, two, four or exon one, three, four. Um, and so often these alternatively spliced transcripts are present in different cell types or at different times, occasionally both present in the same cell at the same time. That's all down to um, the splicing mechanism and what gets determined in that, which is still being learned about. There's so much in genetics that we are still learning, which is great. This is actually how drosophilia regulate their, their sex determination, okay, is through alternative splicing. So um, there's this key gene, DSX, that regulates the sexual dimorphism in drosophilia. So as you recall, drosophilia really, um, it's being male is not determined by the presence of, of, a, of a Y. It's whether or not you have only one copy of an X chromosome or if, or if you have multiple copies. And so the splice is changed. The way the splicing is changed is whether or not you have one X chromosome or two X chromosomes. And so there's this particular gene that um, is expressed differently based on the number of chromosomes you have. And so in the female, you have exon 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you exclude uh, um, exons 5 and 6, whereas in males, they skip 4 and have 5 and 6. And so this particular gene, uh, I believe is for a transcription factor. And the way this transcription factor is built will affect what ge other genes are then expressed by this, um, by the fly, if it goes more male or female, so the sex right determining region. Okay. From transcriptive function, okay. So we have RNA molecules that don't actually go on to code for any proteins, okay. We have a lot of different shapes and interesting forms of RNA in addition to just messenger RNA that goes to the ribosomes. So we have, um, this case, we have these things called rRNA, okay? So this is the uh, weight 23 subunit of ribosomal RNA, okay? And we have the 16 subunit ribosomal RNA because ribosomes are made up of a blend of protein and RNA. We have little things called microRNAs that form these hairpins and transfer RNAs, which help our amino acids get to the ribosomes. So put into context, some of the roles that these non-coding RNA molecules play, well, long non-coding RNAs can affect transcription initiation. That is still being worked on, but it looks as though there are more things at play in transcriptional initiation beyond what we already talked about. Okay, they're diverse functions. We're not sure exactly what those do. We have um, small nuclear RNAs that help regulate where and when that alternative splicing occurs. 
Okay. We have a uh, transfer RNA that pairs up with mRNA in the anticodon codon loops in the ribosomes. Okay. And then there are pieces of RNA, so the 5S RNA, the 5.8S, the 28S, the 18S are all thing are all parts of RNA that are structurally part of the ribosomes that carry out translation. MicroRNAs are really interesting because they actually target little spots on the uh, messenger RNAs. Okay, so in animals, they are targeting in the microRNAs, they're targeting the three prime untranslated region. So here's our final exon, and then we had this like gray area before the poly A tail. Um, and then in there were only we're only just learning about this over the past like five to ten years. And then target sites are pretty variable in plants. And so this particular mRNA has multiple sites for microRNA interaction. Um, some messenger RNAs only have one site. But what they do is they literally just, they're a little piece of RNA that matches up to the um, mRNA. And then that blocks translation or targets the mRNA for degradation. So these guys are like little tiny stop signs floating around. So here's an example of a drosophilia gene, okay, the gene snail, okay. We've got transcription factors that help promote um, transcription of this. Uh, and here's the mRNA. So here's our little, you know, the transcriptional start site there, goes through, transcribes. It gets spliced, processed into mRNA. Here's a mature mRNA. But then there are a bunch of microRNAs that actually grab us onto the tail there and uh, try and try and get it destroyed by the next exonucleases in the cell. So we've got a whole lot of things that say start, and we've got a whole lot of things that say stop, and together there's this balance of not letting too many transcripts build up in the cell, so that there's an only there's there's stuff being made and enough of them get produced, but then not so much as as overtaxing the cell's um, sort of molecular metabolism. Okay, so there's our transcription factors that turn on expression and they're upstream. And then we have the snail expression uh, that ends up being affected by the transcription factors in these microRNAs tagging in downstream of the main gene. Okay. And any particular cell will express some, but not all of these regulatory molecules. Everything is different depending on what cell you are, what cell type we're in the body, what's being expressed by the cell next to you. It's all very exciting. And there we go. Mar uh, microRNAs turn off the expression of the gene. I wrote all of them anyway, and their target sequences are downstream. So here's where microRNAs get really interesting. And this is a phenomenon called RNAi or RNA interference. Okay. So we could use a sequence from any part of the coding region of a particular gene. So we look at some double-stranded RNA from this myosin gene. Okay. And we interject some of that double-stranded RNA into the gonad of, the, of a particular worm. You inter introduce this RNA there. And then this double-stranded RNA is treated like microRNA and forms RNA with the target gene. Okay, so it sort of blocks transcription of that target gene. So the worm lays an egg with this myosin gene that's now affected by this double-stranded RNA, and that egg hatches into a paralyzed worm. That mRNA from the myosin gene is blocked from translation, so the expression of this gene is repressed, but it's only repressed for one generation. This doesn't carry over into the reproductive cells. It only affects the myosin gene in the muscle cells. And so then the paralyzed worm can produce a normal offspring with a functional gene because the mRNA is affected, not the DNA. The DNA is still there, but all the mRNAs were affected. This effect is transient in most organisms. So it, it either lasts one generation or it clears up even before that. But we've got this interesting, you know, transient technology called RNA interference that can be, um, is, is being harnessed as a way to, without changing the genome of an organism, affect the trans, um, the, uh, uh, expression of genes and such. So especially as an ethical alternative in humans where you don't want to affect the somatic line, but you do want to treat someone for a genetic disease, uh, this is really being looked at as a, as a serious possibility or, or um, replacement for traditional gene therapy. So this is kind of an experimental application of what microRNAs actually do, but it's the same cellular machinery in both processes that you take the single-stranded nucleic acid, you form, you hybridize it, it forms a complementary hybrid that either targets it for degradation or blocks translation. So it's kind of a neat little um, technology that's under development. Okay. 
So the next piece here is this idea of, uh, so we have RNA interference and SI RNA, which is called short interfering RNA, different from a micro RNA, where we get our double stranded RNA and either strand could be degraded, but we only see the effects if the strand uh, can base pair with, with the messenger RNA, this um, short interfering RNA. And so mismatches are permitted. It doesn't have to be exact. Okay, there's our SI RNA, short interfering RNA. And it has a similar reaction to the micro RNA where it blocks translation and targets for um, destruction here. So micro RNAs and short interrupting RNAs have very similar purposes in that they both end up sort of targeting uh, mRNAs for either degradation or blocking translation, but they're slightly different at heart. Whereas uh, micro RNAs have distinct coding regions and they, they're encoded by their own genes. Short and erupting RNAs are some things used by transposons and viruses and um, areas of genes that are of, of the chromatin that are silenced or reduced by um, um, epigenetics or methylation. Uh, the nature of the precursor being that we've, don't worry too much about that. Uh, interestingly enough, in terms of evolutionary conservation, uh, microRNAs are pretty conserved in related organisms, whereas short interrupting RNAs are not conserved. They're pretty random. And that um, the regulatory target is different, whereas MR microRNAs regulate different genes, like they're pretty targeted. They seem to be part of the regulation mechanism. Uh, short interrupting RNAs sort of look very similar to uh, the genes from which they originate. They're just uh, sort of a quick little feedback loop on themselves. And then um, microRNAs uh, tend to only really partially complement near that three prime untranslated region where the um, short interrupting RNAs are so small they tend to just fully bind and be fully complementary to the region they're targeting. So kind of cool and has a lot of implications for RNA interference technologies.